what I'm hoping to do today in this in this talk is really to um, to frame the conversation and the uh, material that we're going to hear from the other uh, leading voices in the interconnect space uh, in the session this afternoon. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is some of the um, uses for optical interconnects and data centers and the drivers and application spaces to adopt some of these new technologies. Um, and this is a relatively short presentation because I want to make sure that we give time to the other the other speakers and hear what they have to say. Um, but in but uh, in terms of an outline, um, I'll talk about some of the application spaces in terms of um, interconnects, how they're used today, and then how they would map in the future. Um, talk about some of the reiterate some of the messages that you've heard from some of the speakers this morning in terms of what we're seeing in terms of growth drivers. And some of the challenges which lead us to introduce some of these new uh, optical technologies into application spaces where they've kind of uh, they're still emerging and then talk about some of the targets and challenges going forward and then hopefully um, that'll be a good setup for the panel discussion that we'll have at the end of today's session okay so starting off i wanted to just kind of just level set here and talk about how we use interconnects in the data centers today. And this is a very simplified cartoon diagram of where we see these different classes of interconnects. And so on the left-hand side here on my screen, and kind of showing you, this is like a cartoon drawing of a multi-chip package that we might see today. And so the interconnects of interest within this package you know, might be things that are intra-chip, so shown um, by these gray uh, arrows within, within a piece of uh, CMOS. And then also uh, chip to chip, so these yellow interfaces, which are various classes between like the big die and then these smaller chiplet die. And these chiplet die, uh, for the, those of you who've seen some of the presentations this morning will recognize this. Um, some nice uh, photographs were shown in those presentations, but those can be things like memories, HBM, and also um, CERTES for longer, longer uh, reach links to come off those uh, packages. So then if you take one of these uh, multi uh, multi chip packages, the way that these are typically uh, packaged into a broader infrastructure is shown over here on the right hand side and what I'm really showing here again is a cartoon representation of a rack with multiple shelves within the rack and so um, and this is really. Um, kind of uh, borrowing from some of the ML infrastructure that we have at Meta, where we've got many of these multi-chip packages are typically meshed together um, by shelf level interconnects shown in red on a, on a, on a given um, uh, shelf. And then those are then connected um, to a broader fabric through um, DAC cables, uh, which are shown in black. So we have multiple shelves within the rack, which connected through DAC cables to um, to um, a network switch, and then those network switches then scale out through um, optical links um, to connect to adjacent racks. And so this is really at a very high level how we how today how we build out very large infrastructures and build really what looks um, you know traditionally what would be considered like an HPC system, but in this particular case, um, as Barath uh, mentioned uh, today, you know these are things that we use for things like um, our machine learning infrastructure. So that's kind of the status quo, and I wanted to kind of start with that to kind of have that picture in everybody's mind. So, uh, you know, Barath showed these, this graph um, this morning as well, but I think it's worth reiterating it for maybe the people that couldn't attend this morning to kind of show this is kind of the, one of the problems that we're dealing with, which is um, if we look at the, um, the magnitude of uh, how the models are scaling and the associated compute horsepower required to, to train these models, um, it's just becoming unsustainable. So on the left-hand side, this shows the evolution of some of these ML models as a function of time, um, and then the associated um, uh, compute, horsepower, compute horsepower in terms of teraflops to train these models. And on the right hand side is the resulting cluster power associated with that. And you can see, you know, that this line gets up to really, um, you know, unsustainable power levels very quickly if we just, you know, continue the status quo growth curve and just project that forwards um, in an exponential fashion. And so this is, you know, uh, as I think a couple of uh, the presenters this morning mentioned, and this scales very quickly to, you know, many, many megawatts. 
And you know, you can also see on the right hand side the corresponding uh, industry trend for some of the actual device accelerators. And I think as was noted today, um, you know, we're all trying to push off um, introducing things like liquid cooling as far as possible because of the cumbersomeness of trying to um, you know, upgrade data centers with that kind of infrastructure. But you can see that very quickly by 2025 and 2027, you're getting to total power dissipations that will probably, uh, probably require that. So that's kind of a problem statement in terms of our evolving infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I think the, the challenge for us as an optical community is that, you know, one way of solving this problem is to disaggregate what I showed you on the previous slide in terms of these multi-chip packages into separate devices in order to spread out the power densities. But we don't have a suitable high bandwidth, low power interconnect to facilitate that. So I think that's the challenge for us, um, you know, as, as an industry and as a as an uh, photonics community um, to support these trends and try to kind of sustain the growth um, and the compute uh, horsepower required as we move forward. OK, so to talk about some of the trailing, ch challenging scale, uh, ch scaling challenges, sorry, uh, first one. Um, I just mentioned was power. Um, now, this is kind of threefold. Um, first of all, power in terms of silicon power density, um, you know, with the end of um, Denard scaling, what that means is even though we can build more and more dense logic devices, the problem is the power density of those logic devices is also increasing. And so the power density means that, you know, eventually we're going to have to, even though we can build larger pieces of silicon with more horsepower per silicon, we're going to have to split those silicon elements up just simply to deliver power to them and also to cool them. So that's kind of one of the first challenges that arises from this. And then also we have an infrastructure power limit in terms of how much power we can get from the utility and deliver to a given data center. So again, that bounds our ability um, in terms of power. Second challenge um, is related to that one, which is ASIC IO density. Um, so what this means is, you know, on a given ASIC, um, you know, we have to have increased, you know, to, in order to scale the memory bandwidth and also the communication between different ASICs. Um, you know, we need increased data movement, but we have limitations um, in terms of packaging and in terms of chip feasibility, um, both the beachfront of those devices, which is typically where the IO sits um, for reasons of routing and, and chip escape, and also just in terms of the bump pitches that can um, effectively, uh, you know, be, be developed. And so that's, that's, a, that's another problem, just escaping the die um, with sufficient bandwidth um, as we move forward. And then finally, related to that is, uh, is signal integrity. Um, so right now, the industry is wrapping our arms around uh, 100 gig per lane technologies. And I think it's true to say that there's been enough investigation into 200 gig per lane, and this is 200 gigabits per lane. I realize we have a lot of computer scientists uh, today who might think in terms of gigabytes. But 200 gigabits per lane um, looks feasible. Um, it's certainly going to be challenging um, the next IEEE project has certainly launched to start uh, pursuing that right now. But there are ch challenges associated to even with scaling to that uh, bandwidth per lane. Electrically, that's going to limit uh, the reach that we can have both on PCBs and also over copper cables. And so we have to look at different system designs to, uh, to, to address that. And then in terms of optical, um, you know, we're kind of reaching the cusp and I'm certainly looking forward to, to hearing a couple of presenters who I know are going to touch on this topic. Where does the transition between direct detect and coherent happen? Um, and, you know, 200 gig looks like maybe the cusp for certain reach applications. So I'm um, certainly looking forward to learning more about that. So then looking at the, um, the different interconnects that I showed you on the first slide, the uh, kind of what I've plotted here on this graph is um, efficiency as a function of reach for these different interconnect classes. And so the, the kind of the trend that you can see right here for the incumbent electrical interfaces, we do pretty well in terms of efficiency, but they tend to be clustered around the shorter um, reach limits. And as you kind of scale to longer reaches, and then you're forced uh, to use more um, elaborate uh, CERDES technologies, the power and the, and the efficiency um, starts to um, degrade and, um, 
And certainly when you get over to optical, um, although you can support some pretty uh, long reaches, you're paying a fairly high price in terms of the power that you need to burn um, to move the data those distances. And so I think the challenge again, just to reiterate, is that we need some solutions which fit into what I've termed the disaggregation interconnect solution space. So low power, um, low power interfaces, um, which are going to support these kind of um, reach uh, requirements. And um, I'm going to map that out a little bit more in a table um, that's coming up in the next slide. Okay, so again, in terms of the uh, target uh, performance metrics that I think are going to be uh, useful and some of the key performance indicators with these interconnects. So what I'm going to show on this slide is, first of all, um, the existing interfaces and the existing interfaces classes that we have today. And those are things that we're familiar with and we can realize, and then talk about what we might need to see in terms of uh, future interfaces. So starting off um, kind of at the chip level, um, you know, we have um, on-chip interfaces, which typically go very short distances. Um, these are things which are contained inside of CMOS and have very high efficiencies associated with them. You can see over here, you know, fractions of a picojoule per bit. As you scale these links and we go to uh, technologies required to connect die together on a package, so MCM type technologies, um, you know, the efficiency um, definitely um, takes a hit and we start to get move into the range of about half a picojoule per bit. And that's also true for on package memory interfaces as well. But for all of these different classes of interfaces, we're able to sustain um, you know, very uh, high, high um, performance in terms of low latency and also a very low error rates, which is you know, really required for memory to memory interconnects uh, which are very intimately you know, tied to um, you know, the compute uh, capability um, that these devices have. And so kind of if you move to the next length scale um, and you introduce some of the longer reach interfaces, and this is things like uh, compute buses such as PCIe, CXL, um, connections to system memory, DDR type interfaces, and then also um, networks or intra-rack, things like uh, DAC cables and TwinX. You know, the lane speeds um, definitely increase because you need to, um, you know, minimize um, the number of wires involved, but also you start to see hits in terms of the, um, you know, the end to end error rates, which then require that we might have to use forward error correction for these longer interfaces. And then also the total efficiency also drops as well. And so you start to get into the, you know, multiple picojoule per bit type uh, reaches. Moving further is where we start to see optics. So in reaches that go, um, you know, in the hundreds of meters, uh, tens to hundreds of meters and beyond up to into the kilometer range, the, the efficiency degrades further. And so, you know, right now we obviously, we use these for our data center level um, interconnects and the data center fabric are all optically based. But I think the challenge is if you look at these optical technologies and then you map them back into things that you might like to bring close to the silicon, you've got a major you know, performance um, hit that we need to address. So I think the challenge that I'm going to um, lay out to the uh, speakers that we have today, and what I'd like to do and come back to is, is it possible that we can define some new interface classes? So a shelf level interconnect, a rack level interconnect, and maybe a row level interconnect, um, where the reaches go from you know, uh, about, you know, sub meter all the way up to 100 meters. And then can we achieve appropriate error rates? And can we achieve the low efficiencies? And I've left some of these question marks here. What do we think as a, as a community, we can fill in as some of these targets? And what should we be striving for? Uh, and what really is possible? So that's kind of what I would like to come back to in our panel discussion um, later on today. Um, and also what kind of uh, latencies uh, can we achieve? Acknowledging that, you know, we can't really do much about physics and speed of light. So we're already, or, always going to be burdened with a time of flight latency, but what additional latencies are going to have to be included here um, for these kind of interconnects? Okay, so just kind of quickly summarizing here, I think, um, you know, in my view, device and system disaggregation appears inevitable for the reasons of power that we talked about. Um, and then some of the required bandwidths that we're trying to deliver, does that suggest that all paths lead to optical interconnects? And then finally, um, how do system architectures and device performance 
um, need to evolve so that we can enable these. And so again, we're going to try to come back and, uh, and fill out that table. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rob. Are there questions for Rob? In, in terms of your question about do all paths lead to optical, I presume you mean uh, outside the chip. I suspect you're not really looking at within a chip. Um, not, not yet. I was thinking more, you know, chip to chip interconnects as we disaggregate the different IP blocks into separate pieces of silicon. Um, uh, does that, you know, does that require, you know, the bandwidths that require multiple terabit links between those chips? Does that mean that we are going to require optics in order to move things apart in an efficient fashion as we exceed what's possible from electrical interconnects? Rob, uh, this is Ram. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about disaggregation. I just wanted to clarify uh, the notions of device and system disaggregations. Are they like at a, you know, you're separating a monolithic chip into multiple chip. That's one form of disaggregation that people talk about, right? So if you can clarify device and system disaggregation just a little bit, that might be helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me, maybe I can just share this. Okay, so really what I'm talking about here, Ram, is if you look at this diagram right here, which, which is the way we currently do things today, um, both at the shelf level, if we were to just continue to scale the shelf level, given some of the power from some of these accelerators that I showed in, in the talk, right, exceeding a kilowatt, it becomes impractical to cool a shelf that this, that's this dense today. Right. And so at the shelf level, I think it's reasonable to expect that you're going to have to disaggregate this shelf and figure out how you replace these red PCB links with optical links in the future to connect these accelerators together. So that's one level of disaggregation. And then certainly even within a rack, there's a limit to how much power I can deliver within a rack. So the racks may become sparser in terms of how many accelerators are possible per rack. Right. Um, and so again, you'd replace the DAC cables with an optical interconnect to enable the same kind of topology, but just more, you know, at a, at a lower density. So that's kind of the system level. And then if you actually look at the device itself, you know, similar on the left-hand side right here, you know, if you could replace these yellow links and then even inside the chip, these gray links with optics, um, to reduce the overall uh, power and the power density of this overall package. That's also uh, an angle that we could take as well, which would enable us to effectively deliver power to these devices and also uh, cool them, but, it, but still connect them in an efficient fashion and get the same system performance uh, that we would today. Yeah, yeah, that helps a lot, Rob. I think there are several hierarchy, hierarchical levels where disaggregation concepts are being discuss, I think that all of them are valid and understand where you're coming from. Absolutely. And I think one of the one of the uh, topics that we that was mentioned briefly today was um, in this morning session was, you know, what level of IO hierarchy, um, you know, do you need and, do, and can you can you still build the same kind of hierarchy that you have today with these very efficient electrical interconnects? Or as we go to optics and we maybe add more forward error correction or more latency, do we need to reimagine you know, how we build systems um, you know, going forward to enable future scaling? 